Good morning, everybody. I welcome in uh, 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 NGVA Europe welcomes you in participating this uh, um, event here online. The title is CO2 emission abatement costs of gas mobility and other road transport options. This might sound to you a little bit dry. And uh, of course, we will see an excellent study that will be um, uh, explained very soon. Uh, but I would like to, to point out it's uh, not just about the study. The study is, is a hook, is a help. It's uh, on the other, it's really about uh, the contribution of G mobility to uh, carbon dioxide emissions. It's about how we can accelerate the decarbonization of our transport sector. And uh, I think many of you have recently seen that uh, the one thing is to promise something on paper and the other thing is to execute uh, and to reach uh, targets. And we all want to reach our targets. Uh, for example, Fit for 55, the minus 55 target, and we want to get a carbon neutral in the future. And uh, that's not so far away. And uh, uh, I think it's, it's really important that also the younger generation uh, get trust or trust are trustful against the uh, uh, science and engineering. And we are engineers and scientists, and we want to give excellent proposals in order to reduce CO2 emissions to the max. Uh, this is really my personal ambition, and this is the ambition of the uh, NGVA team. And uh, therefore, we want not just only to kick off this discussion that there is a, uh, an excellent contribution by G-Mobility. And uh, we want to, to address also ourselves and our mission to the politicians of Europe that there are also other measures except uh, electrification. Uh, we don't want to see all the eggs in, in one basket, so to speak. And this is our ambition to contribute to our European CO2 targets. But before we discuss this, and we will later have a discussion, we have to listen and we have to study. And therefore, we asked uh, a consulting company, a company called uh, Frontier Economics uh, to prepare a study for us. And uh, Frontier Economics is pretty well known because they recently also prepared uh, a concept for the crediting of carbon emissions, a crediting scheme. They did it on behalf of the uh, German uh, uh, Ministry for Economics. And uh, insofar, that was, this was an excellent uh, relation. And uh, we asked Frontier Economics to prepare this study we will now listen to soon um, uh, for us. Just as an explanation, Frontier Economics was uh, started in 1999 and is owned entirely by the staff and has roughly, as far as I know, 350 uh, uh, of staff in Europe. And uh, I heartily welcome now two representatives of Frontier Economics. That's Mrs. Uh, Amber Gorczynski. She's a consultant there. And uh, Dr. Matthias Janssen, he's the manager, manager door, uh, there at uh, Frontier Economics. And uh, yes, the floor is yours. Please start with your study and the explanation of it. So yes, um, th thanks for the introduction. And uh, I hope actually it won't be that dry. Uh, we, it, it's, I mean, it's a number focused study. Uh, we look at carbon emissions and, and, and associate cost and, and calculate um, abatement cost of, of different technologies. Uh, so it's numbers numbers focused, but it, it also has some some policy implication implications, and, and I hope it will be interesting for you. And we are looking forward to the QA session later, in particular the panel discussion. So I will now introduce you um, into the the background and, and and the motivation of the study in a bit more detail. Um, before then, Amber Kuczynski, who uh, comes out in our London office, I am uh, in our Cologne office, uh, will then talk you through the approach and the key results of the study before I, I will then conclude. And later in the panel, we will see 
David Bote, who is a director, again, our German offices in Cologne, Berlin. So this is a, a teamwork, really, and this is also reflective of how we work at Frontier Economics. So really a across sectors, like in this case, particular transport and um, energy and across countries. So as, uh, as background, why is it so important that we look at um, carbon emissions and carbon emission reduction from, from road transport? Um, we are all aware of the challenges of um, global warming and the ambitious targets that the EU has set itself to tackle global warming. Um, in particular, by 2030 already, we now need and want to uh, reduce emissions by 55% compared to 1990 levels, uh, which means that we need to achieve roughly the same emission reduction over the next decade that we have achieved uh, over the last 30 years before. Uh, so it really needs an acceleration of, uh, of efforts across the board, really. And um, transport is one of the key emitters uh, today with more than 25% of uh, total emissions in the EU. And of that, road transport is responsible for more than 70% of, of, of the emissions in the transport sectors. And uh, you can see here, this is uh, mainly passenger uh, road transport and also um, heavy duty and light duty transport. And in addition, the volume of transport is likely to increase even further uh, going forward, uh, which is illustrated here in, uh, in a forecast made by the European Commission, uh, where we see on the left-hand side um, passenger road transport uh, volume that's forecasted, and on the right-hand side the, uh, the particular heavy-duty transport with, with quite substantial increases. Um, so to still achieve the climate targets and, and allow road transport to contribute to that, uh, we, need a, we need to cut down the per vehicle emissions uh, substantially and quickly. And that in turn requires technology options that are scalable and available now. And um, NGVA, as the NSS has, has introduced, asks us to look in particular uh, into gas mobility. And gas mobility is a technology that is available today and, and also scalable. And that holds for, for the vehicle level. So gas fuel vehicles are available and mature uh, pretty much across the board of transport categories. Gas mobility can build on existing infrastructure uh, with regards to transportation, distribution and storage. And um, this, there's also capacity to provide further demand for mobility, which is a, a big advantage uh, over some of, some of the other options to, to decarbonize or defossilize mobility, such as, for example, electrification or hydrogen mobility, where it needs uh, quite substantial expansions of the infrastructure. And then ultimately also fuel supply potentials are there for gas mobility. Uh, there is natural gas supply available, which can be used as a kind of bridging fuel uh, already reducing emissions compared to um, other fossil alternatives such as uh, gasoline or uh, diesel. And in addition, biomethane or even synthetic methane can be used on an increasing scale. So gas mobility is available and can contribute to um, C2 emission reductions uh, in the next years already. But EU policy like, often narrows down the perspective to emissions from, um, from the usage of the vehicles um, and as such kind of ignores or disincentivizes the, comp the contribution that uh, low carbon and renewable fuels can provide. Um, and here 
the graph you see uh, the, the life cycle of a vehicle from manufacturing over energy, uh, production, infrastructure, use, and end of life. And um, on, on all of these stages in the value chain, there, there are emissions occurring, and, and these occur in different uh, geographies and different sectors. Um, but, but like many policies, in particular the EU fleet targets, as an example, uh, they focus on tape, tape pipe emissions alone in, in something they're called tank to wheel approach. And um, this assigns zero emissions to electric vehicles, and that's irrespective of whether the electricity, uh, which with the, the vehicles are powered are fossil or renewable. Um, so so that uh, that's on the one hand side, and then combustion engine vehicles such as uh, uh, CNG or LNG vehicles, they receive kind of a fossil reference. Uh, and that is, again, irrespective of whether the fuel is, is actually fossil or renewable, where there are still tailpipe emissions, but the, the an equivalent amount of emissions have been um, have been bound in the production of the fuel, and and that is uh, ignored in such a narrow tailpipe uh, approach. So this kind of framework is not really reflecting the whole picture, and this and is thus uh, risking that there are biases and and uh, and an inefficient transition to carbon neutral mobility. And then there is also um, other stakeholders that want to get rid, for example, uh, of the combustion engine altogether, uh, and irrespective of whether the, the, the engine is fueled with renewable fuels and, uh, or, or the fossil fuels. So in this study here, uh, the aim is to look at emissions and also cost along the whole value chain. So not only at the use, but also at, at emissions and cost occurring in the manufacturing, in the energy fuel uh, production and an infrastructure level. Um, and we do that for a typical passenger car and a, a typical truck. And we look at different uh, powertrains, so engines and, and fuels. And we then calculate carbon abatement cost uh, for these always comparing it to a fossil reference like gasoline or diesel. And this uh, aims to, to gather information bases to allow for cost-effective achievement of climate targets. Uh, so really to see what kind of the, the value is in terms of emission reductions uh, that, that comes with the money that spends on the economic costs that are associated with these um, carbon emission reductions. So that is the aim and that was the background. And now Amber will talk you through the approach and the key res results. So Amber, over to you. Thanks. Um, okay, if you go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so as Matthias said, our study analyzes carbon emissions and economic costs for several road transport technologies, which are shown here. And we focus on the near term. So all of the emissions and costs that we present here are based on forecasts up to the year 2030. Uh, and we look at some key options for passenger cars and trucks. So for passenger cars, uh, we look at a gasoline from fossil option, uh, a fossil CNG option, uh, a pure biomethane option uh, based on a feedstock mix um, that NGVA um, has provided us with. Then we look at a mix, so a 60% um, fossil CNG and 40% biomethane passenger car. And finally, uh, a battery electric vehicle, which we assume in 2030 is powered on um, the European uh, electricity grid mix. And then for trucks, we also have several options. So we look at a diesel option from fossil, uh, an LNG from fossil. 100% uh, bio LNG based on the same feedstock assumption 
uh, and we also look at a mix of fossil LNG and bio LNG, uh, again, based on the, the supply uh, availability the NGVA would expect for bio LNG in 2030. And finally, we also look at fuel cell um, vehicles, uh, and for these we consider um, grey hydrogen, and we also look at blue and green hydrogen. Um, so could you go to the next slide, Matthias? Great. Um, so those are the vehicles that we consider in the study. And then what we do is draw on published studies to calculate um, costs and emissions for each vehicle. Uh, and we aim to take a wider view than the pure tailpipe tank to wheel focus. So for emissions, we look at um, the emissions associated with manufacture of the vehicle, um, the well to tank emissions associated with the production of fuel and its transport to um, the pump, and also tank to wheel emissions associated with the use of the fuel. Uh, and then for costs, we also take a, a, a wide view of costs. So we look at the manufacturing costs associated with um, direct production of the vehicle. Uh, we look at the fuel production costs, uh, the cost associated with transporting the fuel from production to use, and also refueling infrastructure. So by that, we mean uh, the additional refueling stations that would be required to support um, an increase in uh, the different types of vehicles. Um, and sorry, just one thing, one more thing to note on the costs um, that's important to bear in mind as we go through them is that we use economic costs rather than user costs. Um, and that's because uh, what we're aiming to do in the study is calculate the cost of carbon abatement to society. Um, so how much does it cost to reduce emissions uh, by one ton of carbon in economic terms? Um, while user costs, so for example, the cost that a user would face um, for different fuels at the pump um, would take into account different taxes and levies. So here we've excluded all uh, influence of taxes and levies, and we just look at the economic costs. Okay, uh, so go to the next slide. Um, so one quite important thing that we're keen to stress in our study is that there's quite significant uncertainty around how costs and emissions will develop over um, the next decade. Um, so we include ranges for many of the parameters uh, that we look at in our analysis. And here this chart is just plotting some of the different parameters um, in, in terms of how uh, relatively uncertain they are. So some things are relatively more certain, for example, the cost of a, uh, internal, internal combustion engine CNG vehicle and other factors are less certain. So um, the emissions associated with battery electric vehicles or the cost of the battery production. Um, and what we can see here, the circles are uh, associated with CNG parameters and the diamonds are with BEV. Um, and there are quite a few uh, electric vehicle parameters that are relatively more uncertain given there are less mature technology. So we reflect that in, in our figures. Okay, we could go on to the next slide. So now I'll talk through our main results, starting with cars and then moving on to trucks. So starting with emissions, um, this graph is looking at just the tank to wheel emissions. So as Matea said, these are the reference of the EU fleet targets. Um, and this is for our five different um, vehicle options. Uh, and you can see it's a pretty clear picture. So for electric vehicles, um, there are zero tank to wheel emissions. Um, while for gas mobility options, um, they all have the same level of tank to wheel emissions, uh, regardless of whether we're looking at fossil CNG or pure biomethane. Uh, then if we go to the next slide. So what we've done here is kept the tank to wheel emissions, which are the teal bars, but then we also include the well to tank emissions, which is the uh, light blue bar. And we add these together to get a well-to-wheel total emission, which is the red bar. 
Um, and so that gives a wider picture um, of emissions across the, the well to wheel cycle. Um, and you can see just looking at the red bars, it's quite a different picture. So now BEV does have some emissions associated with it. So here we've used uh, the emissions associated with the average EU 2030 grid mix. Um, and the different gas mobility options now have quite different levels of emissions. So fossil energy has relatively higher emissions and pure biomethane has actually negative well to wheel emissions. Uh, and this is because um, there are emissions bound during the production of the biomethane. Uh, and then the mix of biomethane and C fossil compressed natural gas um, has, has a kind of linear mix of those two emissions levels. Uh, and then if we go to the next slide. So this is taking an even wider picture. So here we've got the well to wheel emissions that we just saw um, in the previous slide. So that's the gray bar here. Uh, and then we've also included manufacturing emissions. Um, that's the light purple bar. And then added those together to get our final total emissions, which is the, the dark purple. Uh, and here we can see clearly gasoline has the highest emissions. Um, fossil CNG vehicles offer some emission savings. Um, and then the pure biomethane option would still have an overall uh, negative total emissions. And uh, now looking at the wider picture, we can see that the battery electric vehicle and the biomethane fossil CNG mix vehicles have a relatively similar level of emissions. Um, and that's partly driven by the fact that there are higher emissions associated with the productions of batteries. Um, than internal combustion engine vehicles. So that's the emissions uh, and now we'll move on to the costs associated with each vehicle. So what we've done in the study is uh, look, look at a range of costs across the value chain. Uh, and some of these costs are capex investments, so the manufacturer of the vehicle. Uh, and some of them are variable, so um, the fuel production, um, cost and uh, we've combined these here um, by annualizing the investment costs uh, over the lifetime of the vehicle um, and using an assumption on annual mileage for the fuel production and transport costs. Um, so what we can see when we look at the total costs is that uh, battery electric vehicles have the highest cost in 2030. Uh, and that's driven by the relatively higher manufacturing cost of the vehicle. And then of the different gas mobility options, uh, the pure biomethane option has the highest cost because it has the relatively higher fuel production cost um, for biomethane relative to uh, fossil CNG. And then the mix is, is somewhere in the middle between the pure fossil and pure biomethane value. So if we go on to the next slide. Okay, so here, um, this slide is bringing together the two components that we just looked at. So we have uh, emissions abated and the cost premium, and we bring these together to the graph on the right-hand side to give the carbon abatement cost uh, versus the gasoline reference. Um, so um, what this is showing is that uh, for in 2030, the battery electric vehicles um, are likely to have a, a relatively high cost of carbon abatement. And that's because uh, while they offer um, emission savings relative to gasoline, they're also relatively high cost. And then within the gas mobility options, um, the pure biomethane uh, option has the lowest carbon abatement cost. Um, and that's because it, it offers um, very high uh, emission abatement relative to gasoline. Um, and that, that outweighs the, the higher cost of the fuel relative to the other options. And the biomethane and uh, fossil CNG mix also has a relatively low carbon abatement cost. It's worth noting if we look at the graph on the, the top left um, that battery electric vehicles and um, 
biomethane CNG mixed vehicles actually have similar levels of emission savings, but the uh, gas mobility option is significantly cheaper than the electric vehicle. So we end up with a lower cost of carbon abatement. Uh, and then finally, the CNG from fossil has a slightly higher abatement cost than the other gas mobility options, because um, although it's, it's the lowest cost relative to gasoline, it also offers uh, relatively lower emission savings than the other options. So when we combine this, um, we have a relatively low cost, but also relatively lower emission saving. So if we move on to the next slide, so, um, as I said earlier, uh, many of these uh, different um, parameters are quite uncertain. So what we just saw was our baseline results. Uh, and what we also do in the study is uh, include some ranges for some of the key parameters. So uh, the graphs on the left here are showing um, a selection of parameters that we that we consider and there's there's more in the study. Uh, and here we have uh, the lower bound and the upper bound for each of the vehicles and the line in the middle is our baseline value. Um, and the, the significant parameters are really the fuel production costs where uh, biomethane production cost is relatively more uncertain in 2030 um, because of uncertainty around the feedstock mix. And the vehicle manufacturing costs are also um, relatively uncertain in 2030 for electric vehicles, um, which is particularly significant because it's one of the largest components of the total costs. Um, so what we do is combine all of the different um, parameter ranges to the graph on the right. And this gives our cost sensitivity range um, for each of the vehicles. Uh, and you can see that the electric vehicles have uh, the largest um, sensitivity range, which reflects the fact that as a less mature technology, it's still uh, uncertain how the cost will develop over the next decade. So um, if we move on now to look at trucks. So here we'll go through the same thing, emissions costs and then the carbon abatement cost. So firstly, thinking about the emissions, um, here we're showing the total emissions. So we've got the well to wheel emission for each truck option. So just as a reminder, we've got the diesel, uh, fossil LNG, pure bio LNG, uh, a mix of fossil and bio LNG, and then fuel cell trucks running on gray, blue or green hydrogen, which all have different emissions levels. Um, and the, so what we've got is the well-to-wheel emissions for each option, uh, the manufacturing emissions for each option, and then these two components added together to give um, the total emissions um, for each vehicle. So clearly diesel has uh, one of the highest uh, emissions. Um, the fossil LNG then offers uh, uh, some level of uh, emission abatement relative to diesel. Um, similar to, to what we saw in the passenger cars, the uh, bio LNG option has uh, actually negative total emissions because um, of the emissions that are bound in the bio LNG production process. Uh, and then the fuel cell options, grey hydrogen um, actually ends up having a similar overall level of emissions to diesel. Uh, and that's because um, the uh, manufacturing emissions of fuel cells are higher than diesel. Uh, and then if we look at blue and green hydrogen, they offer um, more substantial uh, emission savings relative to diesel. Um, but um, it's worth noting that it's, uh, again, relatively uncertain um, what volumes of blue or green hydrogen will be available for use in transport in 2030. So if we move on to the costs uh, of each vehicle. So again, here we've combined um, capital costs such as the truck manufacturer um, with uh, per kilometer costs like the fuel production. And the first thing to note is um, fuel production costs are a much more significant part of the picture for trucks than for cars because they have a much higher 
um, annual mileage. Um, and uh, what we can see here is that um, the uh, vehicles running on a mix of bio LNG and fossil LNG um, and fuel cell trucks running on grey or blue hydrogen all have a relatively low cost uh, in terms of the total cost, while the pure bio LNG and the green hydrogen fuel cell options are relatively more expensive, and that's really driven by this higher cost of the fuel production, which, uh, as I said, has a big impact for the for the trucks. Um, and as Matthias mentioned earlier, um, there's also some uncertainty around the availability of fuel cell trucks at scale in 2030. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, so this again is bringing together um, the emissions abated and the cost premium relative to diesel on the left hand side. So that's the two uh, components we just went through um, to give an overall carbon abatement cost relative to diesel. And I'll just highlight a few points here. So the first thing to note is that LNG trucks are actually uh, lower cost than diesel and they have uh, lower emissions. Uh, so when we put that together, that gives a negative uh, carbon abatement cost for fossil LNG trucks. And then trucks running on pure bio LNG or a mix of fossil and bio LNG have a relatively low cost of carbon abatement of around 100 euro per tonne of carbon equivalent abated. Uh, and that's despite having kind of different emission and cost profiles. So the bio LNG has higher emission savings, but it's also higher cost. Um, than the mix, which has still uh, emission savings, but is lower cost. And then the cost of carbon abatement for the fuel cells um, varies quite significantly based on which type of hydrogen we're looking at. So the blue hydrogen um, option is relatively low uh, cost of carbon abatement. Um, that's because the cost of production is, is relatively low. Um, while the green hydrogen uh, has a higher cost, although it also has uh, higher emissions abated. Um, and finally, grey hydrogen, as I mentioned earlier, um, actually doesn't um, save any emissions relative to diesel. Um, and so that means it has a prohibitively high carbon abatement cost. So we've capped that here at the top of the graph, but in reality, the, the cost of carbon abatement is a uh, in a sense, um, infinite because there's there's no emissions saving. Um, so the conclusion of this is uh, that gas mobility options um, can contribute um, as part of the mix. Um, and Matthias will now talk through some high level conclusions and policy recommendations that were part of our study. Yeah, thank you very much, Amber. Um, yeah, indeed, that was a very quick run through the uh, the study, and obviously there's there's more details in the study, and we can jump into into other elements uh, in the Q A session if if, if required. Um, but to, to kind of repeat, the key results of of the study are like in relation to gas mobility, uh, that gas mobility mobility can help to contribute to reducing CO2 emissions uh, at comparably low system cost that holds for passenger uh, and heavy duty road transport. Um, that's the, the one thing. The other is gas mobility is available on a on, on vehicle, on infrastructure and on the fuel supply level and thus can contribute to um, reducing C2 emissions over the next years. What does this mean for policy? Um, like, the one thing is that policy should allow for technological diversification. Um, mobility needs are very diverse, um, and and there's like lots of different technologies with different advantages and disadvantages, and there's definitely no one size fits all solution. Um, and at the same time. 
uh, many developments uh, in the future are quite uncertain. Um, so this really means that policy should at this stage keep options open uh, and not neither implicitly nor explicitly uh, exclude any technology options that can valuably contribute to um, to the carbon uh, abatement targets. And uh, this really then calls for a, a technology neutral approach. Um, and, and such an approach would also allow gas mobility as any other renewable or low carbon technology option uh, to become part of a white technology mix uh, to reduce transport C2 emissions quickly. So I'm, th that's kind of a, a high level policy recommendation. Um, I'm sure we will dive into more concrete aspects of that in the panel discussion. Um, but at this stage, that is it from our side. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Amber, for this uh, excellent uh, presentation. I would like to add uh, some some topics. No, first, I would like to encourage the audience to make use of our uh, Q and A um, possibility that we have. There are already uh, some questions in it, and uh, uh, we will answer them uh, as many as possible, mainly in the uh, discussion panel. But uh, I think we can also address right now some questions. But before I do that, I would like to make an addition. Um, um, what we just heard is is known from by engineers and scientists uh, really since years, and it encouraged me should encourage us uh, that uh, you right now with your investigation proved that this is it's still an, a feasible, a very attractive option to make use of uh, renewable gases, especially biomethane in the car and especially the uh, heavy load transportation sector. And uh, this adds affordable costs. This is something that uh, goes through uh, since, since years and you once again proved this with your methodology. And what I would like to point out also is the fact that we, with our fuel, can go below zero, which uh, at the end will be necessary in order to reach the uh, uh, plus 1.5 degrees Celsius target uh, uh, developed in, uh, for Paris, the Paris Agreement, until 2100. Uh, we started too slow, and at the end we will have to reduce uh, 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 greenhouse gases from the atmosphere and uh, by this available methodology we can uh, instantaneously make uh, achieve this. I think this is uh, worth to mention and it's also worth to mention that the uh, technological development of the ICE uh, is not at the end at all. There are also possibilities. Now I would like, because we have some time, I would like to address a question. And one question is, how can you measure, and, and maybe this is uh, to both of you, how can you measure, estimate the avoided emissions in order to have negative emissions for uh, compressed biomethane? How is this measured? How is this ensured that we achieve negative emissions? Maybe you can give an insight. Yeah, yeah. So I can um, take that. So the the source for this is um, the feedstock assumptions for the biomethane production. So um, our assumption for 2030 is that uh, quite a large proportion of this comes from uh, manure, um, and um, we've taken our source for the emissions from the Jack Well to Wheel study um, and uh, in that they they assume that um, because if you if you leave manure in the field it uh, releases methane directly um, and that's uh, more harmful uh, in atmospheric terms uh, than the alternative of using that manure um, capturing the emissions and turning it into biomethane um, and so that's why you end up with the negative uh, uh, emissions for biomethane because using it as biomethane um, is uh, less harmful than directly allowing it to release uh, 
the manure to release uh, gases and fields. Maybe I can add something. Um, these are not just estimates. Uh, as far as I know it, the, the process is controlled and certified so uh, that it's really ensured that we reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. This is not theoretically. This is practically done already in place as far as I know. We may ask this later to Klaus Sauter, for example. Well, and there's there's another question uh, we have the time to ask, and uh, this is uh, Jörg Neugärtner is asking this. What is the level of CO2 per kilowatt hour considered for the green electric power in this study? Uh, I think we would need to check okay. the details of that, but um, you can see it in the study, and we're using a uh, grid mix electricity. If I get the question right, I, I, I also cannot see it, but for, for green electricity, like renewable, if it's from, from wind or, or photovoltaic, for example, then the C2 intensity is, is a zero on a fuel production perspective. So we are not going that far that we do a, a life cycle analysis that also takes yeah. um, the C2 emissions of the manufacturing of, for example, the, the wind uh, plants into count, so that will be another um, another step deeper into it, uh, which which wasn't in the scope of of this year. Okay, thanks for this. And uh, there's uh, another question we might uh, right now answer. Um, we are asked why we haven't taken into account the recycling aspect, either in cost nor on the CO2 perspective. I think this was a principle from your study as far as I understood this, Matthias. Mm? Um, yeah, actually, I mean, it's, it's, that's a fair question. Uh, we, th this just wasn't in the scope because it would, would have added like more complexity um, because there's also some some uncertainty around uh, end of end of life um, emissions, um, which can be either positive or negative uh, when when recycling comes into into place into play. Um, but what we see from from most of the studies, like in, in with regards to um, to emissions, uh, there there isn't a big difference between the uh, the technology that we look at. So taking this into account uh, wouldn't add the kind of narrative and the, the results uh, in, in a sense. Thank you, Matthias. We might uh, go now already to our keynote speech if uh, Søren Gorde is already uh, online or other. No, nope, I'm online. I've heard the presentation. I'm very impressed. So oh, I'm huh? ready. Okay, thank you. Please, please allow me to introduce uh, you to the audience, uh, Sir. Um, uh, I'm very proud that you uh, uh, take part in this uh, session. Um, I learned that uh, you uh, made your career in the military sector, but you were um, for between 2004 and 2010 uh, Minister of Defense uh, of Denmark. And uh, right now you are a uh, member of the uh, uh, European Parliament, and in this function, you are also a member of the uh, TRAN uh, uh, group there, Transport and Tourism, among others, and also in the Committee of Beating Cancer, which is also, from my perspective, also a topic when we talk about uh, diesel fuel, for example. But anyway, I'm really excited that you are willing to take uh, part in our uh, in our online session here, and. Uh, now the floor is yours. Start with your keynote speech, please, Sir. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me today. And I must say that I'm, I'm really pleased that I, in the, I enjoyed the meeting right from the start. I think the presentation was very interesting. I'm not saying I understood everything uh, of what has been said, but I would say that I think this uh, presentation should be seen by all politicians dealing with the green transition. I often say that politicians live in a kind of aquarium looking out to the real world and uh, we have we are bright to reach out to the real world uh, to meet the real world and that is what I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm doing today I think we as 
politicians. Uh, we should not come up with concrete solutions. We should rather formulate the problems and set goals and how to achieve them. Well, it is then up uh, to the market to achieve uh, those goals uh, we have formulated. Now, the European Union has itself uh, the ambitious objectives of, being, of becoming climate neutral by 2050, as already mentioned in the presentation and known by everybody, and consequently has raised its 2030 climate target. Whether the objective will be achieved and what impact this will have on EU competitiveness and employment strongly depends on the de design of a suit of climate uh, policies for the coming years. Transport and future mobility will be a central element of these uh, policies. With increased uh, climate targets, there is added urgency for transport to accelerate its path towards uh, net zero emissions. To, to facilitate this acceleration, a broad portfolio of solutions is necessary to support the full spectrum of geographic, economic and uh, vocational market demands. Considering the lack of a one-size-fits-all solution, I think it is important that all low-carbon options, including alternative and renewable fuels such as biomethane, play a role in the energy transition, not only on the existing fleet, but also, also for new vehicles to limit the greenhouse gas emissions from the road uh, transport sector across the EU countries. Relying on full electrification alone will not result in climate neutrality in 2050. Against this ambition, the EU Commission has outlined the sustainable and smart mobility strategy and will revise important mobility and uh, energy legislations, such as CO2 emission standards for cars, vans and also heavy duty vehicles. These upcoming revisions are an opportunity to implement a truly technology neutral approach by including the contribution, all uh, options available which also means renewable fuels such as biomethane. It is therefore important to recognize and include the renewable fuel dimension in the revision of the CO2 emission standard regulations for vehicles. Leveraging on the CO2 emission reduction only at tailpipe level, it is, as also mentioned in, um, in the presentation, it is not sufficient to ensure the shift to carbon neutral mobility. Without the contribution of renewable fuels like biomethane, the CO2 emission from the EU fleet will not be reduced fast enough to meet the target in 2030 and towards net zero objectives in 2050. Also, it is important to avoid a two-speed Europe while heading towards a carbon neutrality mobility system. People need transport and our uh, economy, economy is uh, depending on transport. Literally, wheels make Europe go around. As the study by Frontier Economics demonstrates, being based on uh, proven engine technologies and an already structured distribution network, biomethane is one of the most cost-efficient ways to contribute to the decarbonization process as the lowest possible cost to society. Besides the cost in relation to emission reductions, it is important to consider the impact on industrial competitiveness, innovation, affordability and employment to ensure a fair transi transition for all European citizens. In the Trend Committee, I'm working on the sustainable and smart mobility strategy. Here my approach is to be as technology neutral as possible. I do not believe that we as politicians should pick the winners. It might be biomethane, it might be hydrogen, it might be electric cars or something else. But what I do know is that the path to try climate neutrality in 2050 will be driven by more than one technology. What I also uh, do know is that we can't go from A to C without crossing B. In my view, many of my colleagues are trying to do that and therefore I'm happy to engage with stakeholders like NGDVA 
and happy to be here today. Thank you very much for listening and I'm looking forward very much to uh, listening to the discussion and also to be engaged in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Søren, uh, uh, for your, your keynote speech. Um, may I ask you a, a question right now, right away? Um, um, you pointed out that you uh, want to keep the field open for different solutions in order for decarbonization. Uh, how do you see it as a politician? Um, we, we want Europe to become carbon neutral until 2050, but the circumstances in the countries, the purchasing power, the income, uh, infrastructure are totally different. We have other circumstances, different circumstances in these countries. Uh, this Is this also a factor that is taken into account because the means might also might be different but the target should be the same but the mean is different what's your view about, uh, what's your view on this is this under discussion in your trends committee yeah that's that's a very uh, important uh, question because uh, as you rightly said you know the the basis for uh, doing this uh, grand tr green transition is difficult uh, is different in in the european countries now all the money that has been given um, mainly to the south from the north uh, in this COVID uh, crisis, a lot of those money will be used uh, or should be used to the green transition. So there will be, you know, money available for countries, but of course they have to be spent on the right uh, things, um, uh, trying to reach the target 2030, 2050. There will also be, uh, you know, infrastructure money from the. Um, from EU to uh, to the member countries, but I must also just um, flag uh, something that worries me because a lot, a lot of my colleagues in the Parliament they talk only about electrification. Uh, also in my country, in Denmark, you know, they have this uh, goal of uh, half a million or one million uh, electrified cars, and you know, you can start digging up the whole country. You can change the whole. Uh, system, uh, electric system, because it, it is it is not possible to do it with the system we have today, and that is why the tailpipe uh, assumption is, is wrong. You have to look into it in a broader way, and and I think we together we have uh, a responsibility and a task to uh, to let this be known. To th this uh, presentation today should be known by everybody, so that they, they can see. I mean, we, we cannot pick and choose a, a technology and call it the winner. We have to let the market it defines it. And, and, and I'm truly worried that we take wrong decisions, that we, you know, we will, um, we will give some advances to electrifying uh, the fleet and then it will cost more money. It will, uh, you know, uh, send uh, some good technologies out in the dark. Some companies are not allowed to uh, enter the market and, and we have to make sure that what we are doing is is um, is technology neutral, so we got the right solutions, and and that we make sure that there is a competitiveness in the sector, so that the best technology and uh, you know where it's a low cost for society, low cost for the citizens, and uh, the best for the environment and for the transition, uh, and that is the technology that should win, and we don't know. Where, what is going to be today, and that is the reason why I think it should be. We should look to this transition in a much broader way than I think some of my colleagues want to do today. Okay, thank you. Maybe one one last question, Søren. Um, we all have learned that uh, the Chinese market is really dominating. Meanwhile, the transportation sector. And um, as far as I'm, uh, uh, my knowledge uh, is um, even China is not only focused on one technology, but makes use of different types of propulsion system in order to keep its or to develop its its mobility system and also develop uh, their infrastructure. And uh, from my perspective, a real strength is in Europe that we have the sort of, uh, let me say, small and medium-sized uh, companies that have very special and dedicated technologies available. And uh, uh, if you go only into one direction, then you might be caught by some monopoly, uh, uh, monopolic uh, companies, and, and then we produce the next, the next uh, field stress 
uh, field, so to speak. Uh, just what's your view on this? Am I totally wrong or, or is this, is, what's your view? I think it is spot on. Um, I, I mean, we have very skilled scientists in Europe. I mean, yeah. we can see that China, they try to, you know, drag them out of Europe and make them, uh, you know, put them into use in, in China. So, so I mean, we have very good scientists, as you said, small and medium and also big companies uh, spending billions and billions of euros in, in research for, for, you know, for a better future. So we must not, um, you know, stop this as a politician by not accepting the fact that we cannot pick the winners and we have to have an open market. Mm -hmm. and, and I must also say, even though I'm from the Liberals, uh, I, I'm, I, I, I'm, sh uh, I'm sure we also have to look into, you know, the market. I mean, uh, you know, is it still, you know, a fair market when you go look into China? I mean, th those are China should not set uh, the standard or the bar or, or pick the winners in Europe. We have to do it uh, ourselves, not to pick the winners, but have an, an open market with an um, with a technology uh, neutral approach. So there is so many things in the question you just uh, you raised and you gave some answer. But I fully agree in what you said about uh, not going the monopoly way, and also that we we have a market that can deal with those problems and issues if we do it right in the political world and, and we set the goals and we we listen to the markets thanks thank you sir these are strong words and i think uh, this will, will will make others also think about the topic thank you very much sir now for uh, for your input into into our webinar today and uh, i would like now to go forward to our panel discussion we are very right in time so that we have enough time to maybe to extend our panel discussion when we started already, right now. And uh, now I would like to make a short uh, introduction. I'm really proud that we have uh, excellent uh, 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 participants now in our, in our uh, panel discussion. And uh, they are from Verbio. This is a, um, uh, a big, uh, I mean, Europe, Europe's uh, biggest uh, biogas uh, and biofuel producer that we have. Then we have the uh, company uh, Neste from uh, Finland with subsidiaries all over the world. We have Group Renault. Uh, what I'm very proud, proud about that, that also Group Renault is, uh, is uh, here in our discussion as well as CNH Industrial. This is uh, uh, um, a very, uh, this is the industrial part of, uh, of uh, uh, this is a, con a conglomerate uh, company with uh, a strong truck manufacturer like Iveco, very, very famous and strong, with a strong contribution to gas vehicles. And last but not least, of course, our consultants from Frontier Economics will take part. And, uh, uh, each participant, each speaker will now have the possibility to introduce himself and the company to the audience. And after this, uh, we will have the possibility to start our panel discussion. discussion. And I would uh, uh, like to start now with uh, the Verbio AG. Uh, it's the largest biomethane supplier in Germany, and so far as I have learned, the only one uh, in the world, the only company that has technologically mastered the production of biomethane from straw on an industrial scale, where biogas achieves CO2 savings up to 90%, and in addition, it avoids fine dust and nitrogen oxide pollutions. Verbio is not only active in Germany, it's... Uh, active on other international markets and hard, uh, hardly welcome now to Klaus Sauter. He's the CEO and a main shareholder of the Verbio AG. And uh, I have to admit in Germany, he's also well known uh, for his uh, sometimes straightforward attacks uh, to the politicians in Berlin with his uh, a block, uh, a smart like straw. We call it Stroh Klug in, in German language, smart like straw. And uh, uh, the people at Adverbio are really smart and in, uh, in, uh, they, they know about uh, biological processes. And now I would like to give the floor to, to Klaus Sauter for his introduction. Klaus, please. Your yeah. Plan. Thank you very much, Jens. 
I also appreciate uh, joining this conference today and I like the presentation. Uh, and uh, yeah, something about Verbio. Um, Verbio is biofuel and technology. Um, so my background is I'm farmer's son. Uh, I started trading with biodiesel in 95. So I'm something like dinosaur in this industry. Um, but uh, we are also producing biodiesel and bioethanol. But since 2010, our main focus is biomethane or renewable natural gas, how it's called in the US. So please move to the next slide. So um, after the food versus fuel discussion started um, in 2010, um, we developed a technology to make biomethane, renewable natural gas, from pure grain straw. This uh, first big scale plant, what we built in East Germany, was supported by the European Union. It was co-founded by the NER 300 program. And there we are really using pure straw. It's a mono fermentation. We have already two plants uh, existing, um, very efficient process. Uh, and we would like to roll it out, but our development is harmed, as Søren mentioned it already, by the few and uh, let's say the concentration um, in Brussels on mainly electrification of the transport sector. So the next slide. Um, the process is very efficient. We need four balls of straw to run a mid-class car one year. Two, four balls of straw is two tons. Uh, we started at a very early stage to bring uh, our biomethane to filling stations. Um, uh, we have big scale effects. Uh, all plants are around 20 megawatt thermal um, uh, uh, capacity. And um, yeah, there were some questions. So I would say the direction from the study is, is okay, but uh, we are even better than uh, your expectations for renewable natural gas. So as I said, the process is very efficient and uh, the CO2 savings right now are even higher than what you have in your presentation. So until 2019, we had a 90% market share with uh, renewable natural gas at the filling stations. And we were at 124 filling stations all over Germany. Next slide. So there was a question how the negative contribution from renewable natural gas came. And uh, Amber answered correctly. That is mainly coming from manure, but a lot has to do with regulation. So when we are using straw, you must know that 80% of the straw in Europe, in the average, is not used. It's left on the fields and it's digesting there. So 1,000 kilogram, one metric ton of straw causes 1,349 kilogram CO2 and maybe some amount of CH4. So to use biomethane is really avoiding CO2 emissions in the agriculture sector. So we are much better, but right now the legislation in Germany is not reflecting these kind of CO2 savings. So if we make a fair calculation, and I think it's easy to follow my, my, my explanation. So if we are using one ton of straw, 1,000 kilogram, we are avoiding 1,349 kilogram CO2 emission in transport, uh, in the agriculture. Then we are producing 2.3 megawatt hours, which is 8,280 megajoule. This is enough fuel six months for a mid-class car. So in the overall process, we are saving 1,830 kilograms CO2 savings. 
Next slide. So there I have a, a scheme. And the scheme is, again, we take the straw from the fields because even from, an, from a farmer's son perspective, we has also have to endure the sustainability in agriculture. So we have to bring carbon back. So only the cellulose and the hemicellulose is transferred into renewable natural gas. 8,280 megajoule. And in our process also, CO2 is built. So 315 kilogram of CO2 emissions. What is left over is all the, the important fertilizer components for agriculture and the lignin. So what we are doing, we bring 2,100 kilogram biofertilizer back to agriculture, which is 100 kilogram of carbon and what is needed for sustainable agriculture. So also from an agriculture point of view, not only producing renewable uh, um, a renewable fuel, we also have to ensure that everything in agriculture goes well. Next slide. And finally, what we also have to take into account, today all the discussion about renewable hydrogen is based on the fact that it is coming from electrolysis. This is a similar development as I saw when we were implementing the tank to wheel approach, because the tank to wheel approach is nothing more than a clear statement for electrification. Something like this is also happening now with renewable hydrogen. If somebody today needs re hydrogen in, a, in an industrial process, it is made from methane. So the process is the steam methane reforming reaction. So you take the methane CH4 and finally you get four molecules of hydrogen. So also here I see more and more the fact that Europe is going to electrification. And all the arguments from the presentation about costs finally i got the feeling that this doesn't matter anymore so the question what i raise finally is is it about decarbonization of the industry of the transport or is it about electrification because defining and Søren mentioned it i think the, the best way and to find the best solution is not that some politicians are defining a technology. They should define the target and the target should be decarbonization combined with the rules around to achieve this target. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm looking forward to some questions at the end. Thank you, Klaus. From my perspective, you belong to the top list where the next participant is already, and he is there since 15 years. Uh, the company is called Neste, to uh, uh, powertrain guys like me, very well known. Neste is placed fourth place on the Global 100 list of the world's most, su most sustainable companies. Hey, this is, this is our participant here, and I really appreciate this. Um, Nessa has been on this list uh, for longer, as far as I know, than any other company of the energy uh, industry. And I, and, and by the way, the best the best car manufacturer is Tesla, ranked uh, position ninety seven, as far as I know, uh, came from seventy four. And I'm really excited that uh, Mats Hultmann, he's head of OEM partnership at Nestle, takes part in our video conference he he is a powertrain guy as i learned and uh, he's he's been with avl and gm powertrain sweden also with Saab, and a hardly welcome from my side and please introduce yourself and your company yes Off. thank you thank you jans so yeah and thanks for inviting us and thanks for the really good discussions and presentations so far really enjoyed it 
Uh, yeah, so my name is Mats Hultman. I work with OEM Partnerships uh, and uh, at Innovation and R&D at Nesta. And I've been also head heading our Well to Wheel initiatives, which connects very well to what we are talking about here today. So uh, since maybe not all of you know Nesta, uh, I'll just give you some short words before I go into more about our view on, on these topics. Uh, and Nesta is the world's largest producer of renewable diesel and jet fuel made from waste and residue. And renewable diesel, that's also known as uh, HVO to some of you. Uh, and we produce at uh, three different sites uh, globally here, so in Finland, in Rotterdam and in Singapore. Uh, and uh, we see that the we are the biggest producer, but we see more and more coming into this field. So currently today in the world, there's about 8 million tons of HVO being produced. And we see that expected to grow to about 30 million tons by 2025. Uh, and we have also started uh, a new business area, which is uh, renewable polymer and chemicals, uh, where we will process waste plastics uh, also. Uh, for the plastic industry. So we're really committed to the renewable production. And our product is sold globally. And we have about 500 stations where you could buy an SMI renewable diesel, but it's also used as a blending component in, in many countries. Uh, and it's also used as a sort of depot deliveries to uh, fleet owners and so on. And it has a greenhouse gas reduction of up to 90%. But if we go into the presentation here, uh, if we go to the next slide, we can have a look at. I think this picture matches very well what we've been talking about here today. Uh, about the tank to wheel versus the well to wheel perspective. And of course the environment cares about the total emissions, not only the tailpipe. And uh, as Saron and other mentioned, the regulation is currently up for review. So now is a really good time to affect this uh, type of legislation. And we, we all often get the question, but we have uh, electric vehicles, why do we need other options? And if we go to the next slide, that's sort of a, or attempt to answer this. Uh, uh, if you look at the dark blue box, that's representing all the uh, fossil oil used in the world today. And the light blue box then is uh, all the oil being used for transport. Uh, and as you can see this little white dot, that represents the current amount of electric vehicles we have on the road. That's about 8 million vehicles. And that will for sure improve. There's different projections. Some say we will have 330 million electric vehicles by 2040. Uh, but as you see, even if we double that, uh, there's still a lot of fossil oil that needs to be replaced. Uh, but how about the renewable then? If we look on the left side, the bottom uh, green box there on the left side, that's the amount of fossil fuel being re replaced by biofuels in 2018 already. So we see that already now bio, biofuel is making a big impact. Uh, but at Nest, we are also looking at new technology. We are expanding our uh, renewable diesel production, but we're also looking into lignocellulosics, uh, how we can grow that, and algaes, and of course also looking into the power to X areas with e-fuels. And we have looked at different scenarios, and we see really that uh, with the technology and the available raw material and so on, we see that this uh, type of low carbon fuels can really play an important role here in the future. As you can see on the sort of scale here on the different scenarios. And as mentioned before also, we, we need all of these solutions and we need to exploit them to the maximum. Uh, and to do that, we need a favorable regulation. So. That's very clear, and I think it's been clear in the discussion here today. And I think this picture can also help when we get the question about ban of the combustion engine. There's a lot of talk about banning the combustion engine, and it's really, I would say, a big misunderstanding, because typically the people that say that, they really care for the environment, 
that they might not understand that by banning a combustion engine, you actually close the door for all these good alternatives, which are needed to replace this huge amount of fossil fuel. So uh, this can be a way of explaining uh, the need for all the for both these alternatives, basically. <coughs> So uh, that was the short uh, part I would like to share with you and also look forward to the discussion here. Thank you very much, much Mats. Mats. <laughs> um, and now I go, go forward to uh, the next participant. I'm, I'm really excited uh, because this was not, not really expected uh, from my side, but uh, we have also uh, Group Renault. Uh, um, a representative from Group Renault in our uh, webinar today. Okay, Group Renault is, is, uh, doesn't need much explanation. And uh, we all learned that the uh, uh, company is going through a strong transformation process towards sustainable mobility. And uh, just last week, I was very impressed, they uh, published uh, a plan how to decarbonize and we will come to this later. I would like now to introduce to you Catherine Girard. She's the uh, expert leader for raw material and uh, energy at Group Renault. She has been working also for Nissan and uh, a heartily welcome from my side and uh, please uh, uh, your, your term now. Uh, so, thank you for your invitation. Uh, so, as you mentioned, um, I'm expert leader on energy and raw material, and I'm working at the environmental corporate planning of uh, the Group Renault. Um, so, I would like to thank you also for the presentation of the study, uh, which presents very um, valuable, uh, valuable information um, concerning the impact of the uh, GOCH4 on the environment. So I would like to maybe to, to start my five minutes um, time by some comment on, on this study. Um, uh, just four points. Uh, the, four, the first point is that uh, globally we share the analysis uh, concerning the ranking and the comparison um, when we talk about CO2. Um, this um, presentation highlights the importance of the uh, composition of uh, biomethane when you talk about uh, BioCH4. Uh, we do not have exactly the same uh, impact because I think we don't have the same comparison. So this point is very important when we talk about BioCH4. The impact might be very different into a, depending on the processes and sources of biomass we use. So this is the first point. Um, my second comment is um, very interesting to compare different level of um, renewable uh, fuel based on 100% of renewable uh, fuel, 0% uh, means fossil and a mix uh, of both um, uh, sources. So uh, very interesting to have all this comparison, but it means that it will be also interesting to, uh, to compare uh, with the same uh, logic and rationale with the BEV and using also uh, green electricity, just to show exactly the same scope in terms of uh, comparison. Um, my third comment is um, the study uh, is based on the C segment, uh, so very interesting, and on a mix of uh, European average. Um, it's clear that uh, if you talk about different level of battery in terms of kilowatt hour, of, uh, if you talk about different country, the, the ranking of the hierarchy might be very different if you talk about France or Germany. Uh, the ranking is a little bit different uh, if you take whether you take about CO2 or whether you take about um, production of TCO. And la my last point was about um, cost because the, 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 the study worked on a global production cost. Uh, in our side, we mainly work and we mainly use the, the TCO, which is a to total customer uh, ownership, which is globally the uh, pocket money of the, of the customer. And by using this methodology, uh, it means that we, um, we insist or we highlight the positive impact of the usage phase because we calculate it on three years. So it's not only a one shot uh, calculation. Um, and just to keep, to keep in mind that with this calculation, it means we um, increase the advantage of the CNG uh, compared with the other vehicles. So just to give you and to be completely transparent uh, on my comment. So TCO again, 
push even higher the advantage of a CNG vehicle and bio CNG vehicle. So it's quite a positive and valuable uh, conclusion. So to sum up, um, concerning this study, uh, we share the globally the well to wheel impact and globally the hierarchy. Again, it's um, stressed the importance to take into account the well to wheel, but also, and you mentioned that, the LCA, which is not uh, calculated here, but it's quite complex. Um, second point, yes, TCO, and when we compare the different level of the powertrain present um, also uh, advantages for the bio, uh, for the CNG and bio CNG. No, no, uh, go back. Um, no, it's not the slide, but um, okay. Uh, TCO present advantages if we compare with um, uh, the different powertrain, it's clear. And the last point I wanted to mention about the, uh, the, the report is the focus on trucks. Uh, you know that we are uh, focusing on light uh, duty vehicle. It means that uh, globally up to 3.5 um, tons. So it's always interesting to have a global uh, comparison with trucks uh, because from the past, we know that sometimes uh, there is a snowball effect from the high duty vehicle to the light duty vehicle. So then uh, I would like to draw your attention on our strategy. Uh, two weeks ago, our CEO communicated on our ambition, which is to uh, reach um, to be carbon neutral in Europe in 2040 and uh, neutral all around the world in 2050. So here we talk about global emissions. So it means uh, we have to integrate in the global uh, calculation, the production, uh, production of our car and also uh, raw material impact in terms of production and in terms of logistics. Uh, just keep in mind that today, uh, when we talk about the carbon footprint, 85% is covered by what we call the well to wheel. So if you compare with the presentation or the study, 85% uh, integrating um, usage, it means uh, CO2 during uh, from um, tank to wheel, and also 15% um, globally in terms of well to tank. So uh, if you go to the next slide, so uh, it's not a surprise for you if I, I tell you that on the next slide, if I tell you that um, so environmental responsibility is key, is key. Uh, we have published for the first time our climate report. It was two weeks ago, so I, I encourage you to have a look on that. Our ambition today, uh, it's clear, and I'm, you know that it's um, it's uh, it's is based is largely based on electrification um, because we think that uh, electrification might, um, might, might be the answer for um, many, many usage and many uh, markets. But at the same time, uh, we realize that it may not cover 100% of countries needed and uh, of usage. So it's the reason why I, I'm here today and uh, because um, globally, in addition to the BEV, so 100% um, electrified vehicle, we also have a very um, lo uh, a look on the uh, different level uh, of electrification. It means HEV and PHEV, and also on other kind of what we call and what you uh, cover. It means alternative energy. We are also uh, deploy. We are also deploy Deploying, um, investing um, some technology and some uh, as uh, gas, uh, for example, um, uh, hydrogen and LPG. Also, we have uh, began to commercialize uh, some vehicle with a uh, good success for LPG. When we talk about bio CNG, bio CNG for us is very attractive, and it's just a summary of what uh, we heard and what I explained previously. Advantages in terms of TCO, advantage in terms of autonomy, if we compare with the BEV, advantage also uh, with some specific uh, assumption, uh, it depends of uh, how, what is the process and the country, but positive in terms of environmental footprint for the well to tank and the tank to wheel. Positive also in terms of availability, why? Because bio CNG is already there, it's based on, on um, nature process so it's already available uh, and also it's positive when we have a look on the momentum in uh, some country uh, in france for example but but also in other country in europe 
uh, one of the reasons behind that is that it creates a positive impact on the global ecosystem. But in the same time, and I'm here also to, to share with you our concern, um, there are still uh, some uh, barriers and some roadblocks we have to, uh, to keep in mind or we have to, to follow. Uh, when we talk about CNG, uh, what is important is um, to have a durable and harmonized public support uh, for all types of alternative energy. Why? Because you know that when we decided to invest in a new powertrain, it's a million and billion of investment. So it's huge investment. So it means that we have to, we need to have um, 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 visibility uh, over the midterm and over the long term. And we need to have a clear idea of the evolution of supply and demand, and for example, access of um, uh, guarantee of origin in all the different uh, countries. And sometimes it's not so clear. Second point, infrastructure is also key, um, but it's uh, an, an evidence. A uh, third point is regulation. So regulation in terms of CO2 from the tank to wheel, but also well to wheel coverage, but also, and it's very important, I, I didn't heard the word of pollutant impact. Uh, you may know that now there is a new regulation which is under review and which will impact uh, the level of emission. It is called the Euro 7. We are waiting for the final text in June. Uh, so here I put a red light, and I'm sorry for that, um, but the, the text, the current uh, direction of uh, this uh, new regulation is very, very severe uh, in terms of um, to, to, to adapt the technology. Why? Because in the new text that consider that uh, CH4, so it means methane, but also azote, um, so N2O, are considered as green gas emission and in addition to that there is many very very severe concerning emission for uh, for the for the, this pollutant considered as pollutant and other pollutants so it Cut means up. from a technological point of view the challenge i i finish the <laughs> challenge with, the challenge will be huge so i just would like to draw your attention on the fact that if we want to to see a future on a cng on vehicle we have to work all together on this um new regulation because it may uh, uh represent a, a burden uh, on the future development on cng <laughs> So globally, um, yes, we believe that there is um, opportunities on that. And again, if I am here today, it's just because we are convinced that a CNG and by CNG uh, present very good opportunities. We just have to be careful that uh, we will be allowed to develop a such kind of uh, vehicle in the future. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Katharine. Uh, we will surely discuss this in our panel discussion, and you you opened so many fields for discussion. It's, uh, but but this is uh, what you are addressing is totally right, and this is why we came together here now today because we have to send our message to, messages uh, to the authorities in Brussels. Uh, next, I would like to introduce now uh, Michele Ziosi. He is uh, Vice President International Relations at CNH. It's uh, a multinational corporation, and the uh, the best brand that is known is Iveco. Iveco is uh, supporting methane as a fuel for many, many years. Iveco is a founding member of NGVA Europe. And please, Michele, uh, uh, the, uh, your five minutes now for a quick introduction. Thank, thank you very much, Jens. Could you see me on the screen? No, we don't see you, but we hear you only. Uh, there is some issue with the camera, I think. Sorry for that. But if you don't mind, I, I will go ahead. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation, Jens, and also to your to your team. And uh, it's really great to be here together in this great, uh, great panel. As you said, as you said, the CNH industry is a global uh, corporation uh, leader in capital goods. We are produce, producing and uh, developing uh, industrial uh, machines uh, for agricultural purpose for uh, road transportation. So we are moving people and goods, and we are also pretty much involved in, con in the construction sector, and we are producing also, also engines. We all together, we are 65,000 people all around, all around the world. 
we our revenues is about uh, 28 billion uh, of euro our footprint is in all four regions in the world and uh, uh, we are also listed in new york and uh, in milan in terms of sustainability uh, we have been awarded for the 10th year in a row as a sustainability sustainability leader in our industrial industrial sector and certainly uh, this award comes from our for the recognition in terms of the processes manufacturing processes we are putting in place but also from the product we are actually uh, producing and uh, selling to our final customer and we are very proud of that and certainly the role of gas and biomethan have played an important role in the, getting this uh, this award um, as you said, we are, uh, I mean, a corporation uh, uh, which is actually uh, has uh, 12 brands. Uh, the one more involved in the uh, gas sector are Iveco, the, tra the truck manufacturers, New Holland Agriculture, producing agricultural machines, and of course, FPT, our uh, FPT Industrial, our engines uh, manufacturers brand. Um, I, just uh, let me uh, explain how we develop our technological roadmap. Uh, the way uh, how we develop our technological roadmap is based on the analysis of key mega trends. In the last uh, 10 years, the most influential mega trends, in our opinion, that had influenced our, our lives actually are the climate change, the food scarcity, and the growing population. Based on the these uh, three uh, mega trends, among others, of course, we um, let emerge the great potential of natural gas and biomethane in transport and in agriculture, because of obvious reasons. So uh, alternative fuels like natural gas and biomethane could help, uh, you know, the fight against climate change. They could ha actually help the agricultural process and uh, put in place a real circular economy that we are uh, urging uh, all stakeholders to be involved in and certainly is a, an, an element that could contribute to reduce the food scarcity in, in, in the world related to the growing population in all regions of, uh, of the world. We started our production of engine running on natural gas in 1997 and uh, of course it was a niche uh, production. Now we can see kind of 50 thousand uh, engines on natural gas and biomethane all around all around the world uh, we were the only one producing uh, trucks running on natural gas and biomethane now we see actually market share growing and growing touching percentage that we could never imagine before so we are really proud of the choice we made based on these key uh, um, mega mega trend and the, uh, I, I pick what, what has been said by Renault about the, the need of an harmonization of the incentivization and uh, of the, for the end customer in terms of vehicles running on CNG and LNG. And but we, we are glad to see across Europe uh, more and more involvement of some member states in supporting uh, natural gas and biomethane. In, the, in their transport policy. We see Italy actually providing support to uh, end customers. We see Spain also providing some support and other, I mean, uh, indirect, I would say, method of support like the mount in Germany are pretty much supporting this, uh, this market, reducing the impact of the transport sector uh, in the countries where these incentives are, are uh, applied. Um, of course, I mean, uh, what, what is a, a real added value uh, on top of that of natural gas is the fact that natural gas is a bridge to the use of biomethane. And we see all around uh, Europe uh, uh, more and more plans, national plans for the deployment of the biomethane ecosystem that will allow end of customer to run really at their zero, zero emissions. I was mentioning New Holland agriculture because uh, I'm also glad and proud to, to, to share with you the fact that by half of 2021, several countries in, in Europe, like Germany, France, Italy, and Benelux, will see tractor running on, on natural gas and biomethane produced by the farms themselves running uh, physically uh, on, on the fields. And this is actually a part of our circular economy strategy um, putting into the market tractor running uh, with fuels produced from scrap coming from the agricultural oh, waste. Okay. Michele, I would like to 
I would like to lead over, uh, please allow me, I would like to lead over now to, to uh, Dr. Bote and then would you like to start the discussion if you allow. Uh, absolutely, thank you very much. I thank you. I thank you as well. And uh, now, uh, Dr. David Bote, he's from Frontier Economics and he also developed the proposal for accrediting scheme. Please, uh, 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 David, uh, please introduce yourself shortly and then we start the discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jens, for the invitation. And, and also, I think I can make it short because you have already seen what, what Ember and, and, and Matthias presented. And, that's exactly the kind of work we we providing. Um, so so uh, Frontier is an economic consultancy, and I think that's important to note that our role in this whole debate of defossilization of transport is just one of an of an economic advisor. Um, we don't have any own stake in this debate. We are not producing or selling any vehicles or, or energy or have any affiliation. Uh, in fact, we are 100% owned by all our employees. And I think that's what we're really proud on is this kind of independency. What we do is we bring our energy and transport sector expertise to the debate, but particularly we, we care as economists, we care about economics. And that is really bringing down carbon emissions as quickly and cost effective as possible. Um, climate change is just a topic too important and too big that we, we definitely cannot afford of losing either time or, or make it more expensive than it's going to be in any way. And I think that's our main motivation to contribute with this economic thinking to the debate. And in this role, we are working for all kinds of actors. Um, we work for governmental organizations like the Commission itself, for national ministries. For example, we work currently in Germany on the, on the development of a fast charging network for electrification. Uh, we do a lot of strategic projects for individual companies, OEMs, energy companies, suppliers. We work for associations, just as NGVA, uh, and also for, for environmental NGOs. Um, and I think that gives us a quite good 360 degree view on the topics, uh, knowing the position from all of the stakeholders, and then itself that helps us to, to, as economists, to understand how market and competition will evolve and how we can reach this objective of making climate protection as efficient as possible. And all, all this debate is a lot about very detailed topics, but I think there are two big topics from an economic point of view with regard to defossilizing road transport, which, which are more or less like the, the red line through all of all our projects. The one is you really have to zoom out and look at the big picture. So don't let any narrow focus like an isolated view on tailpipe emissions or, or uh, individual sector targets distort or a technology choice. You have to look, and that has been proven, I think, in, in our work for NGVA as well, uh, we have to look at least well to wheel. In the end, you have to do a life cycle view because at the end of the day, climate doesn't really care about where, when, or by whom any emissions occur. It's just accumulated amount of CO2 and greenhouse gases we emit. Um, and in this regard, we should really address this as a, as a holistic systemic problem. And any individual target, individual, uh, individual threshold for sectors or actors are really counterproductive because it incentivizes the thinking of, okay, if I can shift these emissions along the in the value chain then it's out of my responsibility and then somebody else has to take care of it and um, that's completely rational but at the end of the day we see a lot of um, reactions in the sector to this kind of incentives which cost a lot of money ca cause a lot of distortions and at the end of the day don't really deliver any meaningful co2 emission reductions because then they are just occurring in the production of of uh, uh, vehicles or in the in the energy sector at the other point and that doesn't really help so we have to create an incentive regime which brings everybody on the table and let everybody decide what's the overall best strategy to deliver mobility defossilized and um, so that's one big topic look at the big uh, big picture and the second one is um believe in technology competition. And that has been addressed already from, from other speakers here today. Uh, I think it, it's, just, it, it's just no option to have a debate today and, and 
pick, cherry pick the one technology which is going to deliver the, the defossilized mobility up to 2050. We simply don't know. Uh, we have a lot of uncertainties. Many of these technologies are still under preparation. We simply don't know what will be available in 10, 20 years. Um, and therefore, we have to go all in and really activate all potentials which we have to contribute to this uh, big uh, task of uh, bringing down um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the transport sector. And therefore, we, we, we shouldn't put all our eggs in one basket and, and risk of running into a dead end, but rather keep it as broad as possible, keep options open and let technologies compete with each other. And uh, then from an economic point of view, that seems to be the, the, the most robust strategy to make sure that we really meet our targets in the mid and in the long term. And this the regulatory is, framework yeah. has, to, has to create this level playing field for such a competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th thank you very much, David. This leads me to my first question, and this reflects all, the question reflects also what I'm, uh, uh, what I read here, uh, where the uh, what what questions uh, the audience uh, is addressing. My question goes to Klaus Sauter. Whenever we discuss uh, biomethane, then we are asked, well, how much can the contribution be uh, to the transportation sector? How how big is the production capacity? What's your contribution? And the second point is that is also addressed here. Um, isn't it better to use uh, this biomethane in other sectors? What, what's your view on this? Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank David for his approach. Yes, we should find the most economical way. And this is also my, my uh, saying that I, I, I focus on the lowest cost of decarbonization. So first of all, um, if we are using the straw in Europe, uh, we are able to decarbonize all of the heavy and medium duty vehicles easily, because as I said, 80% of the straw and in Eastern Europe, even more is not used yet. The farmers leave it on the field and it's digesting there. Um, where you know we have a, a broad biogas industry in germany um approximately 9000 plants and uh 95 percent are producing electricity but uh the price to make electricity from biogas is is very expensive uh, we're talking about 16 to 20 cent per kilowatt hour and I think their solar and wind is much cheaper. So now to go to, to, to the transport sector and uh, our focus is mainly the heavy duty transport where electrification from our point of view um, is, is more expensive anyway. We need a lot of investment in infrastructure and uh, to do it with the new vehicles, uh, um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the person from Iveco um, told it already, they were the first, Iveco was the first company who brought the natural gas truck to the European market, uh, a few months later Scania and recently Volvo. So we have the trucks, the infrastructure is growing. And finally, uh, Jens, you mentioned that we are also in the US market active. And the development, what we see there, is also going clearly to more uh, natural gas uh, trucks, heavy trucks. And uh, this development there is accelerating. And just something about the costs. At a price of $75 per barrel of crude oil, we are competitive with our CO2-saving biomethane. And as I said, our contribution is negative. We mm. avoid emissions yeah, yeah, yeah. in the agriculture sector. And this is the approach from David. So finally, we are negative. We are, we are taking out CO2 of the atmosphere using the nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is ob obviously not understood by, by all, uh, uh, all our, our viewers here on the internet. We have to address this. Um, I, can, I don't have the time to ask the question, but I would like to to uh, to get your view, Mats, 
uh, on this topic should uh, should what should legislation do should we have uh, should we incentivize incentivize somehow renewable fuel what's your your view on this what's your approach in brussels and that of your administrations in helsinki or in in you are in sweden i know mm? yeah. yeah thank you i mean uh, we think really that the renewable fuels should be taken into account and we need to include them in this uh, co2 legislation that is now up for review uh, the legislation for passenger car was sent out for a public consultation and there was a question there is if a mechanism should be introduced that takes into account renewable fuels and low carbon fuels and over 1000 responses and out of those responses 70 percent answered that this is really important so we think that this will also help to create the sort of the awareness at DG Klima and other places that this is an important topic and uh, uh, I think the model developed by Frontier Economics, the crediting system, is a good example of how we can start to take renewable fuels into account. And we that's something that we at Neste feel is really important and really are working on to promote. Okay, this this is pretty impressive, 70%, and this is a message uh, we could also address, or we would like to, to ask Søren to take care about this, that the feedback was really positive regarding these questions. I learned this as well. And um, there's there's uh, a question coming up uh, regarding Group Renault, and uh, uh, some of the audience would like to have a closer view or some some insights what uh, what Renault is trying to do also re in regard to the upcoming legislation modification in in Brussels uh, Katrin can you give us uh, a, a little more insight so the question is about all kind of regulation no the question is mainly on how to include uh, uh, renewable fuels into the co2 emission legislation what's what's your position on this uh, so uh, as i as i show you um we have communicated with a clear commitment and target for the well to wheel and globally for the carbon footprint so it means that in our objective we will have to work on the usage it means on the cafe what we call the cafe on emission during the usage the well don't to wheel but we will also have to work on the um on the part of the value chain so it's clear that for us any kind of support that will help to decarbonize um, the production phase and the well to tank will help uh, to go to and to to reach this objective um, right now, there are all, already some um, re, uh, regulations uh, regulation that integrate, uh, for example, LCA philosophy or rationale, like, for example, the RED, um, Renewable Energy Directive, which integrates um, some threshold uh, linked to the, um, it's not LCA, but it's clearly close to LCA. And uh, uh, we hear now about an, a, a, great, um, a great increase uh, in terms of target. So this will uh, increase um, the part of um, decarbonized uh, fuel and energy uh, in transport. Uh, concerning the current uh, negotiation um, by 2030, that you know that uh, when you mentioned minus 55% uh, in terms of uh, CO2 reduction compared to 1990, it means that we expect in our side a strong revision um, for the regulation concerning the CAFE, so uh, tank to wheel, uh, from 37%, so we expect more than 60% in terms of revision, 60% of decrease uh, during usage phase in 2030 compared to 2021. So this is the first point. Um, there are more and more discussion about how to take into account the all value chain and even how to take into account the LCA. Our position is to say that um, uh, in the mid-term and long term, it's clear that LCA might be used, for example, to compare uh, the different kind of solution and powertrain, including a uh, well-to-wheel, uh, to compare the, what is the best solution uh, concerning, for example, a light commercial vehicle and sp some specific usage. So it might be an additional tool to give some insight on what is the best solution. So this is, a, this is our vision. Uh, if I talk about um, CO2 regulation, and again, I'm not uh, there is also pollutant emission, which is very important.
Uh, maybe I can add one thing. Uh, we didn't talk about um, announcement concerning the ban. Um, you know that there are more and more announcements uh, in Europe. Um, ban, so it's very different sometimes. Um, uh, politicians uh, talk here, uh, uh, talk about um, diesel ban or IC ban or fossil fuel fuel. So it's very different. Sometimes we hear about IC ban, sometimes diesel ban, sometimes sometimes fossil fuels. Yep. Um, so we have to be careful about that because again the definition is not so clear. So it means that maybe there is some uh, some uh, we can open the door for some flexibility. But if we talk about uh, ban emission, uh, IC sorry IC ban IC ban is IC ban. It means that. Uh, it will uh, decrease the level of opportunity to develop new, new, new kind of technology. So we work on that in order to integrate what we can, what, what we hear, because there are more and more stakeholders and um, region, uh, city are key stakeholders now in all this discussion. Um, so it's very important to, to, to keep in mind all these uh, new announcements, just to be sure that we are in line in terms of uh, yeah, yeah. From my perspective, uh, it's uh, we shouldn't uh, take everything as granted. What's what's being said uh, uh, in all political fields, and on the other hand, we have a uh, discovery plan for Europe due to the Corona crisis. And uh, uh, now I would like to address a, a question to Michele Ziosi. Uh, because um, how do you see uh, the connection between a recovery plan and amount you have have got uh, or money you have got from from Brussels and the technology that uh, that should be used and the decarbonization of, for example, the heavy load heavy truck sector? What's what's your view on this? Uh, thank you very much, Jens, for for your question. So some of uh, recovery plans have been submitted to Brussels. A uh, few in the next, in the last, in the last days. Um, let me actually further elaborate, elaborate about one of the plan I know uh, the most, the Italian one, and I, I really actually uh, appreciate the fact that the Italian government really put a lot of effort in recognizing the role of natural gas and uh, biomethane. Just to give you uh, uh, an example, if I uh, recall well actually the numbers over there but actually in terms of renewal of uh, the um, public transportation fleet the investment foreseen is about two billion of new vehicles and among of these vehicles also cng vehicles uh, will be actually uh, incentivized um, other numbers very important for for the sector are certainly almost 2 billion euro for the for the deployment of a biomethane uh, ecosystem. Uh, we are talking about the conversion of the whole biogas plant into plant producing biomethane and the, also investment for new uh, plant of, uh, um, pro of production of bio biomethane. Or worth mentioning also uh, kind of um, 4,000 institutional vehicles for firefighting brigade that uh, will be not only uh, running on electrical power train but also on on cng and uh, if i if i may uh, link because we are running out of time to what have been said by the colleague from from neste i also uh, appreciate uh, also the intervention of the italian government and other member states into the public consultation uh, on co2 regulation for cars and vans where as has been said, 70% of the response have been have been positive in the in the sense of supporting the a methodology to account the fleet target, uh, the, the the positive contribution of renewable fluids in the in the into the fleet target. And I think I'm quite sure since the the dialogue with the European Commission is always so open. I would say that actually the uh, the claim of the civil societies ngo industry should be actually considered not only for cars and band of course but also for the further revision in, in 2022 of of um, uh, heavy duty heavy duty vehicles yeah. so to, uh, to answer your question to close uh, i would say that I, I really see a good effort from member states in terms of recovery plan as far as cng and biomethane is concerned i really looking forward to see to seeing other plans coming from other member states in that sense
Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Michele. And I would like to address my last question to David Bote because we discussed uh, your study and uh, you, you prepared the study and uh, previously you also developed this crediting scheme that can help to establish a regulation that would enable a speed up of CO2 uh, emission reduction. What would be your recommendation you you have learned now everything you're in a neutral position you developed a methodology what would be if a politician uh, would ask you uh, what would be your recommendation for to brussels totally neutral um, i think it's built on what, what have been just said by, by all the others uh, we just learned in this study and, and several other studies that there are really exciting opportunities out there to bring down emissions in the transport sector and they they and most of them uh, require a change as as in the provision of the energy more upstream as well as a change slightly slightly more uh, in the in the uh, vehicles and even maybe some in the in the use pattern and the application so that's an integrated chain which has to, where every every element has to link it to each other and if we can establish an an, an regulatory regime which incentivizes this cooperation along the value chain, then there's, there are huge opportunities out there to, to deliver decarbonized uh, mobility. The challenge is that currently we, we treat each, each element in this chain very yeah. separately, and there's no yeah. incentive for interlinkage. And that's exactly where our proposal comes into. By crediting system, it would be a first step to get the chain elements Please. interlinked to each other. Please and then, of course, there's mm -hmm. plenty of way further to go down the route of life cycle treatment but i think that would be a first step excellent um as we are running out of time i would like to to make a short summary and uh, from my perspective uh, we learned from from uh, sir and gorda that uh, uh, there are positions in in, uh, in the politicians or in politics uh, that promotes the uh, let me say the a variety of solutions and uh, would not like to to be focused on just one single solution obviously there's also um, uh, a will to to enable competition which is from my perspective also really necessary technological competition we learned that uh, really also job creation by uh, building up a, a bio uh, uh, by biofuels and by uh, biomethane uh the creation of jobs right after the um uh, uh, corona crisis is possible and the resources are really uh, huge uh, i did not see this this uh, uh, chart so far from from neste and this was really impressive and uh, i think in total we should go forward and emphasize our activities and our communication into the direction of the european commission in order to enable this uh, let me say colorful landscape for propulsion systems now i have <laughs> we come to an end i have to thank you very much i have to thank the participants i have to thank the audience for their patience and for their contribution i have to thank you very much for taking part in this uh, in this uh, webinar i would like to continue uh, this format and uh, today a special thank go goes also to my team in brussels that supported me well and a special thanks to uh, robin herman who uh, in spite of of something uh, he achieved, uh, he had he had a, an, uh, an accident with his with his bicycle uh, we uh, could do this um, do this web conference many thanks for your support the bell is ringing already thank you for now and hope to see you soon in our next discussion thank you